Hi, everyone. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Newly Purnell. I cover tech in Asia for the Wall Street Journal, based here in Singapore. We have a great uh, panel today. I'd like to just jump right in. Um, can we go one by one and just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Max. I'm the CEO of the Lazada Group. Uh, Lazada is a you know, e-commerce destination website in the six main markets in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Vietnam, and Singapore. Um, we've launched just under four years ago. Um, would be clear market leader in the five markets that we launched in originally. Um, uh, the overall kind of philosophy that we have is that we think about e-commerce very much about focused on the customer uh, and figuring out in this more complex region the easiest way that we can assure the same customer service uh, as we have uh, you know, in the US or in China. Um, and I think that the second thing which really differentiate ourselves from most other e-commerce companies in the world is that we focus on the region as a whole. Uh, we have local operations, but we focus on the region as a whole uh, because we see a real gap in, in brands or cross-border merchants wanting to enter the region and, and the complexity of the market and the size of the market making it difficult for them to prioritize themselves. So we really focus on, on being a one-stop shop, you know, whether it's a Xiaomi, whether it's a Samsung, uh, whether it's a cross-border merchant out of Shenzhen to really figure out a way for them to enter these markets and, and access this kind of big customer pool of 550 million people. Uh, hi, I'm Jenny Lee, uh, G uh, General Partner at uh, GGV Capital. So we are a U.S. and China cross-border fund investing in both uh, U.S. and China technology company. Uh, we've been in this market for 15 years, uh, and so along with the growth of the internet uh, growth in China, we've also participated and helped a lot of Chinese companies become good internet giants as you know it. Um, so companies like Alibaba, Commerce Space, China in the travel space, um, uh, 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 Yuku which is in the online video space. So these are public companies, uh, Chinese public companies listed in the US in the respective uh, technology vertical. Max mentioned uh, Xiaomi as well. So again, as China goes from PC internet uh, user growth to mobile internet uh, user growth, we've been able to participate uh, in that growth as well. So for us, it's all about technology. Uh, we tend to come in a bit earlier. So sometimes when it's just an entrepreneur um, with an uh, idea, but these are serial entrepreneurs that we know, that we can kind of back them. And then, of course, through the Series A and Series B uh, round as well. Uh, good morning, everyone. Is this working? Uh, my name is Nick Nash. I'm the group president of Garena here in Singapore. Uh, before that, I was the founder and the chief executive officer of General Atlantic's effort here for Southeast Asia here in Singapore. Garena has grown quite a bit over the last five or six years uh, from a fairly small company with a low profile now to the largest internet company across Southeast Asia uh, from a net revenue standpoint. Uh, we have 4,000 people across the region. We operate in three major pools of consumer spending. One is entertainment, one is financial services, and the third is social commerce. We have a set of products country by country across each of those application categories. On a personal note, it's just a great, great honor, and I'm very humbled to be here at this, at this conference. My closest friend growing up was a Milken scholar and uh, attributes much of the opportunity and advantages he had in life growing up to the program that, that Michael started. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Tom Magnanti, the president of the Singapore University of Technology and Design. I'm delighted to be here with this distinguished group of uh, entrepreneurs and in, uh, industrial leaders. George Gobo once used the line, uh, sometimes in the world you feel like a pair of brown shoes in a world of tuxedos. And uh, these are the tuxedos, I'm the brown shoes today, right? I'm not, not, a, not an industrialist, not an, not an industry leader. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I'm a longtime uh, faculty member at uh, MIT, that little uh, college uh, technical school in the United States. Was former dean of engineering there for eight and a half years. We we're establishing a, a new university. Have been establishing a new university in Singapore, as the name indicates, focused on technology and design. In my best of moments, I think uh, we're creating. These, these people all know about first releases and second releases and third releases of products. This, uh, this is the second release of MIT, so it's MIT 2.0. I'd be happy to share with you what that means. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Riadi from, from the Lippo Group. Um, for us um, in Indonesia, uh, we believe that over the next 30 years, we're going to see probably the most attractive consumer story uh, in the entire world. Uh, we're targeting the 80 to 100 million people out of Indonesia's 250 million people who are that who make up that emerging 
uh, affluent class who will be consuming uh, over the years. So from the moment they're born in our hospitals to when they go to our schools, when they buy groceries, they go to our department stores, they buy homes, they take out mortgages, um, they watch cable TV, and if they need health care, um, and until even uh, if, if they need a cemetery, you know, we've got it for them. Um, so we want to touch them. We want to touch them multiple times uh, across their lives. And this middle class segment of Indonesia uh, are the middle class people that have dreams. They grow up, they want to raise a family, they want to buy a home, they want to send their kids to university, they want to they have a better life. And hopefully throughout that time, uh, you know, we're there for them, allowing that to, to happen. So while this is happening though, and I think in Indonesia this is really one of the most exciting stories, um, finally in Indonesia, the digital ecosystem is coming together. And in many ways, what we've seen in China, what we've seen in, Indone what we've seen in India, the same thing will happen in Indonesia at a faster, more accelerated phase. So what we've done over the last 24 months is set up, uh, we've set up a separate division, um, funded separately, separate culture, separate office, separate people, separate compensation structure, separate everything, to really go after this digital um, dream, if you may, digital opportunity. Um, so a year ago, we launched MataharimMall.com. Uh, Matahari is a 40% market share department store in Indonesia, probably the leading consumer brand in Indonesia. Uh, and we've made it into a, uh, what is now Indonesia's leading e-commerce uh, marketplace um, uh, with an O2O angle as well. And happy to share uh, more about that in, in, a, in a bit. But that's really what we're doing. Uh, really, really exciting. Uh, great growth, great progress. Um, so, and it's uh, wonderful to be here uh, today with all of you. Great. John, let me, let me ask you. Um, you have launched this new e-commerce site. You're in direct com competition with Max here on the end. Um, and we're both leaders. <laughs> you're both leaders. Uh, um, an enormous market, as you said, over 250 million people. Um, I know from speaking with folks that people are really excited about the potential for Indonesia, um, emerging middle class, increasing internet connectivity, low-cost smartphones, giving more people access to the internet. Tell us how you're going to beat Max. Uh, or are you competing? Uh, what are you doing differently? Is there enough room for both of you? Are you getting in too late? Tell us, tell us how you're going to deal with this guy. Boy, this is pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you have a journalist moderator panel. <laughs> Look, you know, many people ask the tough questions. What's going to happen with the Indonesian rupiah? It's now at a 17-year low. What's going to happen with Jokowi? Will he stay? What's going to happen when the Fed rate increases? What's going to happen with competition? Is e-commerce 10 years from now a single-player market or a double-player market? For me, all those questions are secondary. Uh, I am, you know, I, for, for us at, at Lippo, and it's no different from Matahari Mall, we focus on finding what we believe to, mo to be the most attractive industries, to be the best business models, and we're here to execute. Um, so in e-commerce in particular, you know, why, like why we think this is uh, the opportunity that we want. I mean, in, in tech, there's a lot that you can do. But we chose e-commerce because number one, we thought that it was a proven business model that we can execute in Indonesia. E-commerce has happened in all over the world, in 60 countries around the world. It's happened in China, it's happened in India. We know it's gonna happen in Indonesia, so that's what we're doing. For us, timing is very important. If you come in too early, you spend too much time educating the market, and it doesn't work out. So we believe that timing is, is very critical, and we believe that right now, you know, 24 months ago, was about the right time. Number two, we also believe in synergies. So we wanted to, you know, I mentioned we, we wanted to set up our businesses separately to allow for this to have all the best that us, the, the agility and the execution skills that a startup would have. At the same time, to have the links with, with Lippo. So I mentioned just now, you know, we decided to use the Matahari Mall brand. You know, that saves us about two or three years in educating the market and maybe 70 to $100 million to, to, to educate a market as large as Indonesia. Second of all, we had our Matahari department store is a 40% market share department store. We have our hypermarket that's a 31% hypermarket in Indonesia with operations across uh, over 60 islands in Indonesia. And we also have the whole O2 angle to it. I don't know if, if, uh, if, if you can pull up slide number, number, uh, number 10, I believe. So one of the biggest challenges in Indonesia is that Indonesia is made up of 13,000 islands. That's when the tide is high, when the tide is low, it's 17,000 islands. <laughs> Delivery is, is difficult and it's very expensive. 
So, for example, you know, we've tried to address this. We think that this is one of the biggest pain points for consumers in Indonesia. We've got these e-lockers across the country. We're going to add changing rooms next to these lockers. So the moment you try them on, you can try on your clothes. You can put them back in if you don't like them. If you go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So you know, we're, we're fortunate to manage one in every three mall in Indonesia. And we believe you know, every year we sell to over 80 million Indonesian consumers. We believe the leverage between the online to the offline but also from the offline to the online will be huge. So we're, we're making sort of this, this the, 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 the O2O synergy. So this is the other sort of synergy that, that, I, that I had in mind. Um, so that's, that's what Matahari Mall is. You know, we wanted to create the largest e-commerce marketplace, but also we, we also realized that in Indonesia, with infrastructure challenges, payment challenges, internet penetration at only 30%, it can't only be internet, it's gotta be internet plus. And that plus, we believe, is this O2O angle. I don't know if you want to just switch the, to the next, next slide. Uh, that, that's, that's a different slide. All right, so that's, that's really what, what it is. You know, we're extremely excited about, about e-commerce in Indonesia. I don't, you know, I, I think Lazada has done extremely well. And I know a lot of the guys there, a lot of the guys are actually working for us now. <laughs> so, you know, I, I need to take this opportunity John, to thank John pays Max. well. <laughs> so, Max. No, we have, a, we have a compelling vision, is what I like to say. <laughs> Max, uh, Max, give us a little context. How long have you been in Indonesia? You, Lazada operates throughout Southeast Asia, but tell us a little bit about yeah. your experience. So we arrived in Indonesia, in Indonesia beginning of 2012. Yeah. Um, I think if you look at our philosophy and, and, and Matahari Mall's philosophy, it, it is a very different one. Yeah. Of course, in the end, we tried to target. And by the way, Nick is also in some sort of way a competitor. I don't want him to feel left out. <laughs> I mean, they're focusing more on the C2C you know, equivalent model of, of a Tencent. Yeah? So I think in the end, we're all trying to target the same customer and then trying to get as big a share of wallet as we can. I think the way we think about the business is, is not that we build the customer experience of what, what we have conveniently as our infrastructure. Yeah? We think that we need to bring the infrastructure to the people. Uh, because I fundamentally, you know, despite having Tesco as one of my investors, you know, I believe that the consumer buys online because he does not want to go to a shopping mall. If he would go to a shopping mall, he could go there in the first place. So it's very much for us to, to figure out how we bring to the products to the consumer um, as fast as possible and as cheap as possible in their house where they made the order. Um, and, and the focus we very much are on there is, is, is you know, build the IT, and in the end we're an IT company, yeah? uh, which is a platform for you know, 70 plus logistics providers across the region. And on top of that, we are building our own fleet. And in markets like Philippines and, and Vietnam, we already do half the orders with our own last mile. You know? So it's very much about building the footprint, building the, the last mile, building distribution center to bring the product the cheapest and the fastest to the people. I think the second you know, real differentiator um, you know, to some of the local players in, in each of the markets that we're in is you know, we have the sourcing power of the region. If you look at you know, brands, you know, even you know, the big FMCG brands, the prioritization for them to say, I launch a new product in Philippines, Thailand, Mexico, or Nigeria is just not as obvious as you know, most people in this room who maybe come from the US or from Germany or from China or India you know, think it is. It's a real difficult prioritization. And giving them a solution you know, to a problem saying, hey, how can I serve all these 600 people without having to build a separate local organization is a huge leapfrog we do. And, and if you look at some of the you know, exclusive launches of brands we brought new into these markets, whether it's a Xiaomi, whether now it's a Lenovo, whether it's a Meizu, whether it's um, uh, you know, some of the other brands. We launched exclusive even for, for big brands like Samsung. Yeah, I think the, the, the complexity of the region, finding a solution for them and finding a solution for the consumers is what we're focusing on. Yeah. Max, you, you mentioned complexity. I mean, we, we tend to think of, uh, or maybe people outside of Southeast Asia tend to think of the region as one whole, but of course it's many different markets with uh, lots of different regulations and languages and, and levels of complexity. Nick, tell us a bit about um, how do you grapple with that at Greena? You're, you're operating in several countries and things are different in each market. How do you deal with that? No, Newly, it's a very, very important point. And I think it gets at the heart of why up until 2015, there haven't been multi-billion dollar internet companies in Southeast Asia. In fact, there have been very, very few multi-billion dollar multinational companies in any industry relative to the scope and scale of things you'd find in Europe or Brazil or the US. Uh, at Garena, we felt very strongly that there was an opportunity to, to stitch the region together, but it had to be done in a hyper-local, very nuanced way. And when I was at General Atlantic, 
making our investment in Garena before shifting over to join the company as a full-time executive, I made the observation of my colleagues that if you look at the poorest state in the US, which I think is Mississippi, and you rate it relative to the most wealthy state, which I think is Massachusetts, it's about a two and a half multiplier in GDP per capita. If you look at the poorest communities in Southeast Asia to the wealthiest, you know, compare Timor-Leste to Bukatima here in Singapore, it's 100x or even 1,000x. So the, the dynamic range of living standards and lifestyles is dramatically different. And John deals with this every day with his consumers in Indonesia, whether it's Jabotebak relative to Manado. It's a very, very different world. So the way we approached it was to have a different strategy and even a different product approach to every single country in Southeast Asia. Maybe the best example of this would be in our own e-commerce business, which we call Shopee. We decided that there was a real opportunity to bring e-commerce directly to the consumers through a C2C marketplace, which in some ways is reminiscent of the work that Max is doing and that the work that, that, that John is doing. But we felt that instead of having a web-based offering, we'd go straight to mobile which in and of itself I think is a reflection of the nuance in Southeast Asia where there are going to be far more mobile phones than there will be individuals with desktop PCs or laptop PCs. But then the second thing that we did was pretty interesting. We elected to launch the app simultaneously in the region but in seven different languages with seven different user interfaces. So the app is actually a different app and only available in each of the country's respective app stores. That makes sure that a customer in the Philippines doesn't accidentally download the app for Thailand and try to ship their product to the wrong location with the wrong payments, with the wrong logistics provider. But the nuance here was very important. The app looks and feels a little different. Of course, the language is different. Of course, the UI is different. And by being hyper-local, but with the same fundamental back end, the same technology behind it, you can win in Southeast Asia. And that's a pattern that we've repeated across each of our businesses, whether it be in entertainment, or again, all of our content is hyper-localized, or in financial services, where everything is moderated and modulated to the needs of each market. And Nick, you mentioned mobile. Um, Jenny, I want to ask you, as an investor, um, Tell us a bit about where you see the growth opportunities given mobile. So in China, you hear a lot about people leapfrogging from desktop PCs, uh, or from you know, leap, not even going on desktop PCs, getting online for the first time through smartphones. When you look around the region, say, any, I guess Southeast Asia, let's say, 600 million people, where do you see the areas for growth given uh, this proliferation of mobile devices? Yeah, so for us, actually, mobile is the universal or global standardizer in terms of platform, operating systems, and then the devices that gets to the user. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, just to give you an example, so of the 7 billion uh, population globally, there are about 2.5 billion who has a mobile smartphone. Of the 2.5 billion mobile smartphone, China has about 600 million. Um, so what that does is that actually the, the, the increasing mobile penetration um, on a global basis means that actually business models are also globalizing very fast and almost at the same time. So, um, <clears throat> and we looked at it from a couple of uh, areas. So commerce is a big area. In addition to commerce, we talk about O2O in O2O. So O2O is a very generic term, but what that means is actually mobile disruption of uh, existing traditional verticals. So when you think about Uber, right, it's disrupting transportation. Uh, in Singapore, we're also an investor in Grab Taxi. Uh, and so that's transportation disruption. You think about education, you think about entertainment, uh, you think about internet finance. So across the spectrum, uh, we are seeing mobile disruption kind of in, you know, changing the way consumers consume um, their product and services. But what's interesting is that the way uh, the consumer are consuming this um, product and services are not that different. Well, there may be local uh, um, you know, uh, nuances in terms of logistic delivery, but the, the urge to say, hey, when you have a smartphone, you, you start by playing games, right, which is the simplest form of digital entertainment or content, and then you look at your email communication. From there, you start to book your, your air ticket from the app that's on it. You, you know, when you're driving, you start to use the map, and through the map, you now have location uh, referrals to go you know, cash in your coupons at the restaurants. Right? So actually, ultimately, the mobile phone is the ultimate face to you in terms of transaction. It's excellent for transaction, and that commerce doesn't have to be just for physical goods. So it goes from physical goods to digital goods to virtual goods in, in, in many cases as well, including financial uh, products. So in the case of um, where we are seeing um, uh, commerce, just since we all talked about commerce quite a bit, uh, so well, when we invested in Alibaba, the, um, the Alibaba uh, business model was really uh, more in China. <clears throat> so it's PC internet focusing, um, leveraging the markets in, in China and then selling to the Chinese consumer. And that was the first wave. As PC internet kind of grew and commerce grew, and China became, um, you know, the Chinese users, uh, and actually global users become um, acceptance to the idea of commerce or buying online. Just to give you another example. So, so 
um, online retail in China is about 10% of all retail versus 6% uh, in the US. So when we talk about commerce and we said this is a huge market, actually this huge market is just starting. And in China, while it's 10%, I think in Southeast Asia, it's probably, or Indonesia, it's probably 1% to 2%. So there's this huge amount of growth. And we are, we are still talking about you know, people going online, PC to, to interact. That, um, that interaction is going to mobile. And as you go into mobile, the other shift that we are seeing is that it's going to start to segmentize by user, right? If you are on Alibaba, you may have 30, 50 million SKUs. How is the user going to be able to serve and flip through you know, 50 million SKUs? So at the end of the day, the mobile phone becomes ideal, has a centerpiece for collection of consumer behavior. Right? So, so what's going to happen is that we are also starting to see a lot of uh, new startups coming up in areas that are targeting very specific user group. So targeting women, you know, age 20 to 25, buying in China, and you know, living in China and buying in China. But we're also starting to see a group of apps targeting women in China, age 25 to 30. They are the up and aspiring group in tier one cities in China, but buying international. In the US, we saw a group of users uh, in what we call the NFL cities in the US, uh, where they are you know, age 15 to 25, buying non-branded products that they cannot get in their offline stores, but they are waiting for five to 10 days for their product and services to be shipped from China to the, uh, to the US. And, and that company was well, a US company, basically has more than 50% of, um, of their trade coming from international users as well. So that content, that app itself, is no longer just a shop where you're you are surfing. It's gonna have curation, right? So women curation in specific sectors, um, the, the, the app is gonna deliver products that you like. So instead of surfing 50 million SKUs, you have 200 products that divert to you. So commerce isn't just going to be just saying, you know, I want a product, I go up there, look for it, and then I buy it. It's actually going to start to take the form of very segmented user behavior curation. Could be brands, could be non-brands, could be fitness products, could be, you know, different types of curated products. And because the market is huge, it's going to be able to, to support a lot of this different usage. And what we do see is that the companies that can leverage global sourcing are the ones that's going to actually, you know, move faster. Right? So, so, and one more example, um, the reason why, why, why I said the world is converging is that when we think about commerce, you, basically anywhere you are, you can buy. Right? But when you think about um, Grab Taxi, you think about Uber, the other mobile disruption that's happening in transportation is this. If you, um, if you live in the US and you're used to using Uber, when you come to Singapore, while Grab Taxi may be easier for you to, to get a taxi, you're more likely to use Uber because you have the app, the app is tied to your credit card, and so you know, instinctively you kind of use this. Right? So Uber has a US company has to think in international from day one. Grab Taxi has a, has a Singapore, our Southeast Asia company, has to think international from day one as well. And so again, you know, if you are watching the space, you'll find that there is a Uber and there's an anti-Uber alliance. And so why are all the alliances in place? At the end of the day, the beat is for you, consumer, because they want to be that app that you use. If you're in Singapore and you're using Grab Taxi, when you go to the US, now you can actually have the service of Lyft, which is a competitor to Uber. Right? Or if you go to China, you can now have the service of Didi Taxi, which is also one of our investments. So in that sense, as a startup, it's not enough to just think you know, local. In those O2O -O sectors, you actually have to start global from day one, because at the end, that fight is for the consumer. Yeah. I think what's, what's important, just, just to add on that, is, is of course you have, with the globalization, a much bigger offering, yeah. which you said you need to curate. But I think the focus here is also that curation is not you know, what it used to be 10 years ago, someone sitting there on a page and putting nice products next to each other and saying, oh, I like this here and I like this here. It was very much around the intelligence of the IT behind it, the data science piece, where you collect the data. You know, everyone has, of course, a local app yeah, where you collect the data and you know what he does on the phone, you know, working together with the phone companies. Does he do this? Does he do this? And then targeting the offering to that consumer and sending that message much easier in the past. We're not in the days anymore where you send out a CRM email and hope it might not make it into trash. It's about sending the message at that moment when the person needs it and give them the offering that they need just when they are doing a certain action on their phone because your phone knows it and your data science can help you target that offering. Yeah. Uh, the next people dreaming up ideas for the next billion dollar companies are probably young people now. Um, what kind of trends are you seeing, uh, Tom, as you work with students here in, in Singapore? A complaint I've heard from people is that 
um, educational systems in many countries in Asia don't encourage creativity. Is that wrong? Is that, is that inaccurate? Um, but what kind of trends are you seeing in terms of people uh, thinking more about trying to be entrepreneurial, taking risks and starting companies, and even though that might make their family angry. Um, what kind of trends are you seeing there in terms of people dreaming? Yeah, newly. And, uh, uh, first, I mean, like the panel is really focused on IT and commerce. Uh, but uh, I used to talk about uh, the trends in technology generally. Uh, and I you know, use the term affectionately the uh, uh, big four O's. And the big four O wasn't turning 40 years old. They all ended at O's. They were bio, nano, info, and macro. Right? So it's the convergence of biology and engineering. Uh, info, as the panelist has been talking about. Macro is complex systems. Uh, it could be, you know, it could be uh, cities, whatever. Uh, uh, bio, nano, in, in, uh, nano, things that are small right? in terms of this. Uh, but if we can turn to slide three, uh, I'll tell you a little story. And this may t give you some sense of, uh, of uh, what some of the students are doing these days. Uh, so um, we just graduated our first uh, set of students at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And our valedictorian, who is uh, a top scholar, uh, she and uh, her, uh, another student have developed a ring. This, I, here's the ring. I don't know if you can get this on the camera here or on the, on the thing. Uh, and this is a ring printed, 3D printed ring. And they uh, created this ring, and then they decided to put the SUTD logo on it, quite, quite nice. And they said, well, we're doing this. We can add some functionality to it. So they put it, uh, took an, uh, the RFID chip that we use to access our offices at the university, which are a credit card type thing, and they put it on here. And that, that raises some technical issues because there's a much less surface area here than on the regular card. So they had to do some technology stuff. They then went, and this will give you some sense for these kids, they then uh, went to the uh, uh, MRT in Singapore. They got, bought a card from the MRT, took the RFID chip, put it in here. Now you can access the MRT. They went to the subway authority in Singapore and said, wouldn't you like to have the, use these? And the subway said, go away. It's too complicated. It's, right? you know, in some ways, because of the complications that our panelists have been talking about. They happened to go to MIT for a summer uh, internship program. And they sent a video to the uh, uh, subway station there and got to the VP technology. He got really quite interested in this. And so he uh, then uh, brought them in. He gave them 100 cards and said, go out to the subway in uh, the US. So as you can see on either this ring or you see on this slide, now, and now they've formed a company. This young woman has now formed three companies. Another one is a drone company that uh, looks at uh, stabilized cameras on drones. Right? Uh, so she's formed three companies. You can go to MIT uh, or go to Boston for $25. You can buy one of these rings, and you can access the subway system in Boston. Right? So these are the kind of uh, qualities I think that the young people in Singapore and Asia can have. I think if we provide the right environment for them at our universities, if we provide them with the freedom uh, to experiment, uh, the right uh, grounding in terms of the type of things they're doing. Uh, so I, I'm actually, uh, I, I, my experience is, they come in and they're, uh, they've come through a system that's, I think, a little bit more rigid and a little less uh, providing those kind of opportunities. But I think they have the wherewithal to do it if we provide the right system for it. So we've seen uh, of our graduating class, a large number of the new class are going to the entrepreneurship community. They're starting new companies. Uh, so we're seeing that. The other thing I'd like to just express, and maybe get the panelists to talk a little bit about this. I'm going to show you some toys, and then we can get back to this. I'm going to show you, many of you have heard about 3D printing. You may have seen 3D printing. I'm going to show you some 3D printed objects. I don't know if you're going to be able to see them very well. All right, so this is a 3D printed object. Right? This is done in a, a very uh, low expensive 3D printer, probably less than $1,000 for the printer. You can print this, all right? Uh, 3D printed bicycle chain. Absolutely no assembly on this. Completely printed in 3D printing. I'll let the panel, give it back to me though, please. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. This is a little intricate type of thing done with 3D printing. Now I raise this because there's convergence going to come between this and e-commerce. It's going to become between this and the type of things talked in our panelists. So this is a rather delicate little thing for 3D printing. This is one of my favorites. This is a 3D printed, it's printed with a, these, this is printed with a more advanced machine because it can do multiple materials. So you might not be able to see it here. This is a completely functioning pliers 
No assembly at all, my friends. Not one bit of assembly on this. All printed, right, in terms of this. And though, now we get to more expensive things. We have one of the only uh, metal 3D printers in Singapore at this university. So this is a piece developed 3D printing, all right? It's metal, all right? It's actually built to steel, and this is a rather complicated looking little ball done with 3D printing. Uh, if you're an a, a airplane company and you've got slow moving parts, expensive parts, are you going to keep large inventories, right? Or are you going to print on demand for the type of things that you want to have right, in terms of these type of things? So this is going to cause some, I think, disruptions to some of the supply chains that the panelists are dealing with in terms of their operations. Uh, we're probably not going to see this for high volume uh, production anytime soon, but we will see it for low volume production. And we'll also see this convergence, if we can go back to slide three for one more moment, then I'll turn it back to the panel. Uh, I want to just focus on this I-ring. So this I-ring is a, you can think of this as an IoT device in some ways. It's a ring that uh, can read for the blind, right? Uh, a ring that you can row over the page and read for the blind. It goes to the cloud, right? And the cloud's got a database that interprets what you're reading. Or you could use this for reading different languages. These are things being developed now by young people at our universities, right? And th that's a new world that's evolving. It's this convergence, I would say, of the physical world and the digital world that we're going to see, I think, much, much of that happening. How it's going to affect these grand companies that uh, our panelists have, I'm not sure, but it will affect them. Yeah, if I can add. So the, the um, e-commerce, as we talked about, or O2O, they are evolutionary, evolutionary business models that's changing how today's world can get more efficient. But what Thomas is talking about is what we in venture capital world terms disruption. So dis disruptive business models uh, in this case is leveraging huge technology convergence right, with um, hardware, uh, software, data integration. And that's an area where I think we're going to see very exciting new innovation come up. So it's a, actually a big investment area for us. Uh, we think that the world of technology is actually going to swing back to the maker's revolution. And so I'm very happy um, to hear that. Singapore has this uh, great uh, institution. To, well, to we're promote. delighted to have it. I mean, it's, uh, it's yeah. actually great, great, uh, great to unleash the talent of these young people, provide them opportunities to, to fabricate and build. I think it's a, it's a very, I mean, you, you said that the, 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 the opportunities are not there, but I think it's amazing. You see the young entrepreneurs in all our countries. Yeah. In a, in, in, you know, in, within Lazada, we have kids one year, two years out of university. You know, some of them leave. You know, some of them leave to bigger conglomerates like, like Lippo, or some start their own startup. But I, you, you see the spirit here too, and I think what is fantastic is you know, with capital flowing in and opportunities coming up, you know, people are dying for, for new opportunities and new chances to, to kind of be creative. I mean, there's no monopoly on entrepreneurship based on DNA. And I think we can be very clear about that. But I think in particular, Maximo, and the fact that these students have access to makerspace yeah. will, I think, unleash a, I think a fair amount of innovation and talent. No, I think, I, I think what, what you've highlighted is, is amazing. Uh, and once this becomes uh, commercial and low cost enough to scale and robust enough, it will change logistics yeah. immensely. Uh, once uh, virtual reality and augmented reality becomes uh, a little bit more perfect, uh, that will change movie theaters. Um, so I think this sort of, you know, no matter what business you are, whether even you know, right now, you know, if, even if you're in e-commerce, which is considered to be a tech company, even that, I think you've got to continue to evolve, continue to innovate. Um, so that's, yeah, that's I mean, the world we live in. This may be li linked to your lockers and things in terms of you know, printing fashions on demand. I mean, yeah. these type of things which people are going to think, I think, more seriously about Absolutely. in the future. Newly, I want to go back to the premise of your question, which I think for the last 20 or 30 years, there's been sort of a recurring undercurrent globally that America has a weak education system for science and math, but produces very creative people. Asia has a very strong education system for the fundamentals of math and science, but perhaps produces less creative people. And I think we would have a strong uh, argument that, that actually is not the case. And I want to share something with you, which I mean, as sort of as, as essentially the, the people that are the offtake for these great students that are coming to the workforce. Whoever's running the slides, can you go to page 14? It's, it's the last page in the deck. At, at, at Garena, we've become one of the largest local employers, hirers of fresh engineering and technical graduates here in Singapore, but also across the region. So I think if you look at NUS here in Singapore, it's the Singapore government and then probably ourselves as the second or third largest employer of new computer science and engineering and, and marketing and business grants that come out of these programs. 
And what we tend to find is that, yes, there are, of course, some cultural differences and some differences in the academic programs between the US and Asia, but there's a couple of things that Asian students are actually much, much better at than we would say their counterparts in the US. And it goes back to values and mindset. Th these are the five values of our organization, and I won't bore you with all the details, but central to the way we think about our company and our strategy are the values of service. Not just in the abstract, but the sense of going after customers and meeting their needs, addressing them at their own workplace, their homes, their communities, and empathizing with the needs that they have in the field, not just the needs that people in wealthy cities in San Francisco or Portola Valley or Mountain View would have. And likewise, the value of staying humble and truly understanding what it takes to, to live the life of one of your customers. We tend to find that in many cases, students coming out of the US or London or what have you, they have less of a sense of those values, not, not on a universal way, but in a less relevant local way. So we would actually make the argument that some of the talent coming out of Singapore, out of Ite Bay in Indonesia, out of the best universities in Vietnam, they are much better able to handle the market realities and the needs of customers here in Southeast Asia than their counterparts might be uh, in the US or in London. As uh, investors throughout the world look for uh, good ideas and good companies to invest in, um, to play devil's advocate, how much of this is overrated? Um, we've heard people talking about bubbles potentially forming in India, um, maybe some Chinese companies overvalued. Um, what would you point out to people out there who say they want to invest in, in startups in Asia or in tech companies in Asia? Um, what are some trouble areas, Jenny, you see? Uh, yeah, well, so when, when, when investors ask me if they should come to Asia or China, I said no, try not to. <laughs> so they, why, why do you say that? Well, she wants to keep the monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> the pollution is bad, the market is tough, the regulation is tough. Food is terrible. Uh, you know, food is horrible, um, <laughs> traffic doesn't work. So, so, so really, um, I, th I think that while we talked about the size of the market, whether it's uh, you know, China, 600 million mobile users, uh, India, 150 million smartphone users, uh, Indonesia coming out as huge hubs. If you combine Southeast Asia, that's another big area. Um, the, the growth in mobile internet is going to come from this part of the region, right? I mentioned 7 billion population that two, and 2.5 billion mobile internet. That 2.5 billion mobile internet users is going to go to 4 billion in the next five years. And, and in the US, that market is going to be still pretty much 300 to 400 million. So less than, you know, a few percent. So from that perspective, definitely from a growth perspective, uh, it's a huge, huge market. Uh, whether you're Facebook or Uber or Google, um, they're all trying to get into China. They're, they've been, maybe the, there are a couple of them who's been in Southeast Asia. So um, from that perspective, um, definitely you, you have to consider the region. You, can't, you cannot be Facebook with a, a part of China that's empty. You don't have the global internet, right? I mean, you, you cannot be Uber if you're only doing a portion of the, uh, the rest of the world and you know, Europe has its own Ola caps, you know, India has their own, China has their own. That doesn't, that doesn't create great uh, companies with, you know, uh, similar services uh, to the consumer. But ultimately, though, the challenges in terms of working here is that if you've been watching the China market in the last um, two to three months, uh, they've been hitting the news on all fronts, from RMB currency uh, changes to capital markets, um, domestic market fluctuations. So <clears throat> the region, though, and, and each of us playing different markets, you know, faces uh, local regulation issues, government trying to, 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 um, to complete reform changes. And so in that sense, there will be a lot of fluctuations. If you're in e-commerce, you will run into commerce uh, regulation. If you're social communication in China, basically you have to be a Chinese company, right? And so there are local regulations. If you're trying to do drones, Drones is a big part of what I invest in. Uh, it's a very exciting space, but also highly regulated. So then you have to work with different regulations as well. Uh, and so those are the challenges, right? And to be able to, to understand the market, it's not just about saying, you sit, you know, sit 3,000 kilometers away and say, oh, this is gonna look like Google in China, and then you make the investment. You have to come to the ground, spend time with, you know, with Max, with, with John, with Nick, with Thomas, people who are on the ground, who have gone through that route. Why do you have to have lockers in Indonesia for commerce? Well, because you can't reach those guys, right? So maybe drones can help to do that. So, so actually understanding the local consumer behavior, local regulation becomes absolutely important. How do you then work with government? Um, GR, government relations, is actually a very critical piece of success as well. So for investors who think that um, you, know, you can just understand the business model from a Western perspective and not just spend time here, then that, risk, that, that chance of success is actually a lot lower. You know, not impossible but it's a lot lower. For, for, yeah. for, 
I think for people that are nervous over what's happened over the last two or three weeks, and I think the honest answer is a lot of people are nervous. Uh, they look at the VIX, they look at what happened in the CSI, they look what even happened on the Dow when JP Morgan lost 20% of its value in a day, uh, and they look at technology stocks here in, in Asia and in Southeast Asia. I just have two words, which, is, uh, which are gross margin. And the reason I say that is over the last three or four years, too many companies have been analyzed on the basis of revenues or GMV as opposed to actual gross margin the money you make uh, uh, after your variable costs. And likewise, too many companies have been selling a story based on a TAM, a total addressable market, based on revenue, as opposed to the more important metric, which is what is the total addressable gross margin pool for that industry. You can disrupt all you like, but at the end of the day, the customer recognizes there's a service being rendered and there's a price to be paid. And if you can make money in that intersection, that's always going to be a great business model. So as people in this room are looking at businesses, analyzing them, evaluating whether they should invest or not, the way we think about it in our business and the way we thought about it at GA was find the businesses with great gross margins. And great What's your view on the long-term and, and short-term perspective of that? Yeah. So what I'm completely struggle to understand every time I open the newspaper is multiples and valuations and you know cycles move and come and go but the longer perspective you have the less relevant they become so you know I had a conversation with an investor who promised me two three weeks ago really long-term thinking and then he told me well China yeah I'll wait another three months that's not long-term thinking yeah so you know gross margin also true I mean when Mercedes builds a factory they don't make money from the first minute they put huge amount of upfront investment yeah so I think you know, of course that is true. You need to work towards a business model which will come, but you're not gonna get innovation and change with the first day cross margin. Yeah, so I, I fundamentally don't, don't agree with you. Yeah? I, I think th the second thing you need to think about is, you know, all this stuff is very short term. Yeah? What you need to look at is, you know, one billion additional people entering the purchasing class. I mean, these people want to be served. They're not you know, going to wait around for, you know, us to get ready and the investors in the U.S. or whoever, you know, feel like it's now comfortable and safe for them to make a move. Yeah? These guys will come. <coughs> the opportunity is there. You know, people just need to take it. And, and to be honest, I think these kind of crises are the best absolutely for, for people like me because, you know, we're still going to go for it. Yeah? So I think it's, it's, you know, it's good that, you know, not some of the stupid investors get scared away and the intelligent in, ones still there. In 2003, there. Alibaba had less than one month of run rate. But they made it by focusing back on the business. They ride through the dark, tough time, and today they are where they are. So every great company that we've seen, um, on average, has about eight to ten years of history, gone through at least two cycles of downturn, and the fact that they managed to survive those and still come up, um, they tend to be the top leaders in the categories. I think, so. I think uh, <laughs> you know, cycles are not only is it a fact of doing business, but we think it's quite healthy. If you take a look at technology, many people look at the 2000s as the first tech boom. Actually, I think that was the second. I think the first one was actually in the 80s. You've got the first tech boom in the 80s, the second one in the turn of the, uh, the, the millennium. Arguably, we're in a third one today. And this will not be the last one. I think this cycle will, will work itself out. There will be another cycle and continuous another cycle. And I think what every cycle allows for is for the investment that becomes the infrastructure that allows the whole digital ecosystem to develop. So in many ways, I think you know, when we cannot build a business trying to time the market. We build a business knowing that right now, technology has changed the way people travel, the way people buy, the way people eat, the way people do everything. And that's not going to change. And the cycles will go up and down. We've got to take a rather longer term view. What's most important is that you've got a business model that can last and work through those cycles. So that's what we're, that's what we're focused on. You know, many tech companies, um, you know, if I may use the term, I think they're renting revenue. You know, I think it's very important. So for me, I think I agree with what Nick is saying. Uh, that I think what Nick is really saying is that you need to have a sustainable business model. And for some business models, they're at a time when it's gross margins. Different business models have different metrics to, to look at that. But in my view, it's about sustainability. How do you, you know, how do you know that whether you know, the cycles go up and down, you can still be in business, you're still growing your business, and that in the next cycle, you're still around. So you, you take a look at the companies that today are, are, are behemoths, like Amazon and all that. These are, these are companies that have gone through those cycles. Uh, and when the cycle is down, people forget about them. Then when the cycle is up, 
you know, Amazon now is another $250 billion company. Uh, so I think valuations is, is one thing. We keep them in the back of our mind. But we're most, most importantly focused on building businesses that are riding on a secular generational shift, uh, focusing on a market that we know well, on a consumer that we know is optimistic. Um, and we're focused on you know, a 20, 30, 40 year time frame. So I'd, I'd be interested in the panel's views on sustainable business models versus disruptive technologies. My guess is that when Amazon started, they probably hardly had a, a, a long-term successful business model. When Dell started, they have probably had this. But they were disruptive in terms of their, their business processes and business practice, right? They had a different model. I'd just be interested in the panel's view on this in terms of disruption versus you know, a, a less disruptive. No, it's a really yeah. interesting question. If I can, if I can Nick, um, we have about 10 minutes left, but we will have time for questions. So start thinking of some questions while we, while we address that. I think my, my, my favorite example, and Tom makes an incredibly important point, I think sustainable businesses tend to be a subset and a very small subset of disruptive businesses, uh, full stop. So for example, two data points. One is, John is so right to point out the history of this. We are sort of in the third technology upswing, and I don't just mean valuation-wise, but innovation-wise, in the last 20 or 30 years. And from 1982 to 1985, there were 200 distinct Winchester hard drive companies that were funded around the world. Now, we know them well from Southeast Asia because we did half of the metal stamping here in Malaysia and Singapore. Yeah. And the reality is that those 200 companies boiled down to three companies, none of which are great companies. And I'm sure I'm hurting somebody's feelings by saying that, but the reality is that that entire industry of disruption, which went away from magnetic tape and this and that, all boiled down to a very small number of actually good businesses. Yeah. Now, sustainable businesses exist. We all know them, the Googles, the Ollies, the Tencents of the world, hopefully many of us at this, at this panel, but it's a small subset. Another great data point of this, and Tom is, again, 100% right about this, is something called dense wave division multiplexing. And that's not a very sexy term these days, but 15 years ago, it was the bee's knees, because this was the technology that let you put terabits of data through a single fiber strand. And the reality of it is, an amazing technology, great engineering, MIT people were involved, it killed the industry. If you could put a terabit through the same damn fiber strand you could put a gigabit through yesterday, there's no economics left in the business. The pricing falls through the floor. Water becomes cheap, oil becomes cheap. So in many, many cases, disruption actually is the enemy of margin, the enemy of cash flow, which is why in so many countries people try to actually very quietly calm down the disruption when it seems to be happening. But everyone thinks they're going to do these disruptive technologies, though, right? So then the question is, what's the winners and what are not going to be the winners? Well, there's going to be very few winners, is the honest answer. Right. Right. At, at Garena, we say that there's no bronze medals in life. <laughs> the Olympics will give you a medal if you're number three. But in most internet businesses, you've got to be number one or number two. There ain't no bronze medal. So you're winning to play or you're winning for gross margin? We're both. I mean, uh, I didn't put the slide up, but there are very few businesses in life that grow quickly and have high margins. It's tough to do both at the same time. You know, we, we, we're very proud of the fact that we've been able to accomplish both, but it is a very difficult challenge. Questions? Uh, over here, yes, sir. Is there a mic? Yeah, I think coming behind you there. Yeah. Great panel. Uh, thank you very much for the time you spend with us. Uh, can you comment a little bit on data security? Because, uh, curiously, it's, it's one of the things no one on the panel talked about today, but when I think uh, we read in the papers almost every day now attacks on U.S. government servers. I work for a big global bank. We get thousands of intrusion efforts every day that we have to fend off, spend millions on that. And then even for Internet of Things, when I think about two months ago, right, where two hackers hacked into a car um, and effectively started uh, using the gear shift and the brakes while someone else was driving it. So. The technological innovation is unbelievable, but where do you see opportunities, both from a business perspective and a technology perspective, linked to the data safety and security component? Good question. Yeah, so security is actually a big part of our investment as well. We, we, we probably invest about 20 to 30% in security. So today, with mobile disruption, um, the areas where technology or security comes in is in particular with uh, transactions. But as I mentioned, mobile phone is ideal, or IoT is ideal. When you integrate hardware and software and data together, it's ideal for getting all this data to create a full profile. But what that means is that there's a lot of sensitive data available. Uh, and so um, whether it's companies focusing on security at the front end authentication, back end cloud hosting, um, data securitization, transactions, um, fraud detection. So those are areas um, that are key uh, in terms of how we think about it. But they tend to be um, uh, definitely forgot, f 
forgotten on panels because it tends to be kind of behind the scene. Security is something that you don't think about until it happens. You know, there's a, there's a big outbreak and then you start to think about it. But it is a huge industry. Uh, and I think that whether you're a US company, a Southeast Asia company, a China company, the, the, the uh, encryption of algorithms, you know, the technologies that you have developed at, in this case can actually be, be utilized on a global basis. Because when you really think about mobile phone, there's only two operating systems, right? Android and iOS. And then the whole back end, it's, it's been a lot more concentrated for enterprise, you know, versus on the consumer side. So in that sense, you, you, companies in that category should actually think of a bit more global. And there's real uh, IP protection around it as well. I would also offer that I think there's, uh, particularly in this uh, inter uh, uh, internet of things, in this convergence of physical world and digital world, you're going to see increasing, uh, as you point out, rightly point out for the car, uh, increasing set of issues that we're going to have to address. And they're, they're quite different than uh, the encryption issues, right? In terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the processors are there, the controllers are there. How do we make, how do we make them secure, right? And uh, so I think the whole notion of uh, cyber security in terms of cyber physical systems is going to be increasingly important to us in terms of how we protect the systems we all rely upon. Why don't we take this one first, and then you behind? Yeah. Okay, I just want to build on um, the comment Nick made, and expand on it a bit. One way to characterize e-commerce re e retail in Southeast Asia today is there's a lot of money flowing into the region. It's being put into promotions to buy customers. A lot of the businesses, as Nick pointed out, are gross profit negative. But customers are getting trained, in a sense, to accept such great promotions. So they, they shop, they're incredibly value seeking and incredibly elastic. And the problem with that is you can have all the sensible business model you want in the world, but if other players in the market are building their business models around that assumption, you won't survive. And I guess the bet that's being taken is when the capital is either switched off or gets withdrawn, customers will suddenly realize how fantastic this service is, they'll become less price sensitive and the world will just be a happier place. Do you, would you agree with that characterization um, and if so, what's the right pathway through for companies that don't want to pursue that strategy? No, it's an absolutely fantastic question, and the living example of this dilemma is Groupon, where Groupon ran around selling people these bulk discounts and ended up conditioning an entire generation of consumers that restaurants that they loved would be 20% off. And the customers got smart about this and realized you should not give Groupons out for your prize restaurant or prize spa or prize travel because you will just simply condition people to expect discounts and living social and others. And the entire Groupon wave of clones have all died because the end consumers, not the retail consumers, but the merchants have, have, have wised up to this. Uh, I think the exact same thing will happen with e-commerce where, I mean, for example, <laughs> it's funny, uh, I love to joke with a friend of mine that when you get off the plane in India and you smell that sort of soot in the air, that's actually all the money being burned <laughs> by venture capital firms selling subsidized iPhones. <laughs> it's a little scary that the cheapest place to buy an iPhone in the world is Paytm in India right now, which, which is not the best way to build a business. We, we believe in the HBO philosophy, which is not, 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 not the sex and nudity, but we believe in the, the concept that if you have content worth producing, it's worth paying for it. It's worth charging a premium. And we're unabashedly open about that with our consumers. The real trick is coming up with stuff that people want and pricing it in a way that people are comfortable. So content is the best example of this. Let's pick the game industry just because it's something that we know a little bit about and because it's been such a tough industry in Asia. The PC game and the console game industry was a dead industry in Asia for 20 years because people pirated the stuff. You walk up to a you know, Simlim Mall in Singapore and you can find any game you want you know, on a little stamped CD-ROM. That's a terrible way to live and of course it went nowhere. But if you gave the game away for free and let people unlock small bite-sized amounts of content that were captivating and interesting, you could actually make a lot of money. So you can solve a lot of these issues, again, by good marketing, good pricing, treating the customer with respect. But unabashedly, you got to make money. I think my, just my point of view is, is you need to really differentiate what is a discount and, and where are you incentivizing the consumer. Um, the you know, disruption happens through amazing technology. Disruption happens because people are incentivized to change their purchasing behavior. Or disruption happens because people are forced to change their behavior. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at e-commerce and some of the, the, the upfront investment which need to be done, which is largely revolving around logis logistics, you need to take your, your view. Yeah. Do you want to invest for the, the customer to be incentivized or not disincentivized not to do it, or do you not? Yeah. If I would charge the full shipping cost at the moment to the consumer or not balance that out with some sort of discount, people will just not change their purchasing behavior. Yeah. The, the cost of shipping 
in Indonesia is still 60-70% higher than it is in Shanghai. Why is that? Because the drop density of a package being delivered uh, you know, is much lower. A rider in Shanghai can drop up to 80 products a day, and a rider in, in Indonesia maybe can drop 30. Yeah? So you, know, you, you, of course, need to see, does it make sense in the medium long term? But if you're not gonna, you know, willing to even look that far, then you should not be doing it. Yeah? If you're going to be stupid about it and you don't even see the long term envision, you're going to say free shipping forever, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah? So I think you just need to be sensible on, on which way you want to take. But you need to have the balls in some sort of way to invest at some point. Yeah? Yeah. That, that, that's a great question. And I, I share uh, Nick and, and, and Max's comments. And this goes back to my comment just now. I think that the danger is that I think companies are renting revenue. And you know, there are a lot of companies out there who are spending like drunken sailors um, to rent revenue. And I think a lot of that is driven by um, the, the capital environment, the capital markets environment right now, where you, know, you try to show that you're number one and you can get a bigger funding round and you continue to do that. that that's, there's an element there, but that's very dangerous. Um, you know, we, we look at business again. We want to be around 20, 30 years from today. It's not about necessarily where you are, but how much have you spent to get to where you are. So I think it's important, you know, coming back, my, my, my single most important today point that this panel has been sustainable business models, sustainable business models, sustainable business models. And, and that's very important. And so we want to make sure, you know, what your cost of acquisition is, how sticky is your, is your consumer, are you converting properly. Uh, these are all very important metrics. Um, so that, that's, that's uh, something we think about every day. If I can just follow up on that, and then we have time for one more question. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, which companies are going to crash and burn? Who's gonna, I mean, seriously, who's gonna run out, who's gonna run out of VC money and, and go down in flames? Anyone wanna venture a guess, or? Should, should we point fingers at each other? Yeah, I'm not serious. <laughs> each I mean, other, is that what you said? <laughs> not each other, I don't think anybody on this panel is going to, but Jenny, anyone wanna yeah, weigh well, in? Well, I, I think that um, the whole O2O space is due for a restructuring. So last year, a lot of capital came into the sector, whether it's for um, in the transportation sector, right, in, in, uh, in China, for example, Didi Taxi and Kuwaiti, at the peak of their subsidy, they were burning 100 million a month. Um, and the end result of that was they were educating the users um, to, book, uh, uh, you know, to book a taxi ride with their phone and to tie your phone, in the case of Didi Taxi, for Wech uh, to tie your payment uh, to WeChat. So while the motive was to kind of educate and bring users into this whole high frequency uh, purchase item. Uh, the reality is that a lot, you, know, you have to subsidize the consumer. Um, the whole food delivery space, um, everybody can now get you know, for 15 RMB, your lunch delivered to you, and by the way, you get a free you know, drink. So uh, $7 or 7 RMB goes into the subsidy of a 14 RMB uh, uh, lunch meal. So guess where all the capital is coming from? Definitely that capital is being, uh, it's, it's from the VC and PE industry. Um, so the hope there is that ultimately, uh, you cannot have you know, 100 delivery companies. You cannot have you know, 20 taxi booking app in a city, right? That while the services do solve a need, we all need instant taxi on call, right? Um, the, ultimately, the provider of the service has to be, it's a marketplace to a certain extent. You need to have enough service provided, the drivers, and you need consumers so that that, that matching is going to happen. So, so ultimately, you will see the one or two companies come up. But the rest of the 99% or 99.9%, they are going to run away. And so if your model is predicated on subsidies, then you're doomed, right? So ultimately, if subsidy is just one technique in your early days to acquire the users and you have more to play in terms of attracting the users uh, to come back, right? Can you get them to come back and buy three times a week versus once in three months? Then that's where you win, right? So I agree with John. I think ultimately, Subsidies or discounts or coupons, they are just a technique, but the long-term business model and what you're thinking, uh, especially in the O2O space, is very important because you want to get to that long-term value of the consumer. So most companies will die. Uh, in most technology uh, innovation, whether it's disruptive or evolutionary, only 0.001% makes it. Uh, and for those who are in it, um, that's, that's what we are all working for, right? So most companies will die. Thank you for that uh, optimistic. <laughs> very encouraging. Finally, last question because we're just slightly over time. Uh, I think it was you. Yep. First of all, thanks to the panel for very insightful for, for your insights. This question is really for Jenny, who's been a very uh, successful investor, very seasoned. Um, you know, for the for many of us who 
have so many great ideas come through our desk all the time. Uh, you know, just wanted to get some insight from you as to, you know, how did you choose the Xiaomi's and the Alibaba's, you know, these companies that came to you very early stage? Um, how did you pick them? Um, what were your criteria? And um, what did you do as a smart investor to help them through their eight to 10 year history and their two down cycles? Thanks. Yeah, so it's a very long question. <laughs> um, sure so, so, so I think it's a very long question, but maybe the, the one formula that you guys should look at is that um, uh, actually founder business model fit. It's a very critical piece of the equation. Right, so if you are 20 year old, a uh, 20 year old comes to me and said, I'm going to do the next Snapchat because I understand exactly how in Southeast Asia, the 20 year olds are going to communicate and hang out with each other through, say, three seconds, you know, live video feed. Sounds good, right? If you are a 50 year old and you come to me with the same story, targeting 20 year old in schools, it's probably not going to make it. High likely chance is not going to make it. So, so it's, uh, there's, you know, there are many ways where we look at it, but, but ultimately um, the founder and the team uh, and the business model that they're trying to do, I think that fit is very important. If you want to do commerce and you have no commerce experience, you are a mobile internet product person who is used to doing just internet software, then actually trying to do commerce the way these guys are doing, very tough. Um, you know, if you see, if you've gone to a warehouse to see how who runs the warehouse versus the guys who develop games, <laughs> very different DNAs. So having the right DNA uh, in place for the team, if you don't, if the founder doesn't have it, he can hire. But it's very important to have that um, um, complementary fit. Max, Jenny, Nick, Tom, John, thank you so much. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.